Good day. Thank you all for joining us today. We are joined with Dr. Laura Mattia and Stephen Craffin from Atlas Fiduciary. And we're going to be discussing the investment markets from this year just passed and hopefully get an insight into where things may be headed for the current year. Uh, so uh, let's kick it off with the heavy one. We're in the middle of a global crisis. Uh, what happened with the market this last year? Well, as we were talking before we even um, got on air, um, it, it certainly was a big surprise to a lot of folks because most of all the equity was up. And, you know, it's hard to compare year on year because the truth is that there are a lot of variables that were highly unusual. We don't need to get into that. Um, one thing that we know for sure is that the monetary and fiscal policy did lead and provide a lot of headwind and even some momentum in terms of the market. So the, the U.S. stock market delivered 28 percent. Um, when it comes to earnings, um, that was it really an unbelievable year. Earnings uh, were up 72 percent, largely driven by margins. And now that probably won't stay because um, we have all these cost pressure pressures and wage pressures, which are um, going to prevent us from seeing that kind of earnings growth going forward. Um, in terms of market risk, it actually was not such a volatile year. We only saw um, a 5% drawdown, which is often in most years, you'll see three times that amount. So it's really unusual. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't a terribly volatile year. Um, when we talk about things like value versus growth, we saw um, large cap growth and value were somewhat in the ballpark, but small cap value really outperforms um, uh, growth of value. So uh, I'm sorry, growth, small cap. So um, that was quite interesting. And some of our alternatives, things like commodities did very, very well. They were up 27%. And real estate, which didn't do well in 2020, delivered 41% uh, this year. So all in all, who would have known? Great year. And I want to mention that there was an, a large amount of uh, fiscal stimulus last year with the COVID uh, relief packages. And there's a lot, a lot of dollars chasing, uh, not as many goods, quite honestly. But also those dollars affected the stock market. And also the fact that bond yields are so low. Most investors, they really have no place to go with it in the stock market right now. So let's stay there a minute, uh, Stephen. What effect has that had on bonds and the fixed income market generally? Well, you know, the, the Federal Reserve has been had been buying bonds to try to provide liquidity into the economy. Uh, and because of that bond, in part because of that, bond yields are really, really low. And in fact, uh, with inflation jumping up to at least 6% right now, bond yields are actually negative, at least on real terms. And probably the most negative we've seen in, in years, or at least in my memory, quite honestly. Uh, how is it that the uh, Fed, you think, is going to respond? I know there's talk of them tightening to address uh, some of this negative yield situation. What are you seeing there? Uh, you know, my, my concern is with high inflation, they're going to have to start raising interest rates, and they may have to adopt a more restrictive uh, money monetary policy, much as we, as we saw in the 1980s when you recall Paul Volcker, uh, he kind of wrung inflation out of the economy by making really, con uh, really constraining the money supply and using other methods. Now, whether that'll work in this in the economy we have these days, well, that's a big question because the the structure of the economy is very different than it was in the 1980s. Yeah, I, I've heard that. That's one of the things that that uh, people are concerned about is the Fed not uh, being aggressive enough, and we could get into uh, something called stagflation from the late 70s, early 80s during that Volcker period. You're right. That could That's be scary. Correct. Yeah, and the disappearance now, which I, I believe uh, government stimulus is going to disappear now. I don't believe they're going to get any more bills through Congress uh, with any more COVID relief or even that the so-called Build Back Better bill. I doubt it's going to pass. Uh, Laura, you mentioned a lot of the uh, equity returns, I think, in the domestic markets. What about international? What does that picture look like? Uh, international had a little bit of a mixed um, picture there. Um, the developed markets were up by 11.8%, but the emerging markets were down by 2.2%. I'm kind of rounding a, a bit. Um, they're primarily driven by the Chinese market, which was down and um, so was the Brazil market. They were down significantly. Um, 
You know, with the real story, though, what's interesting about um, international, if you look at it, is that um, U.S. stocks have been outperforming international stocks for over a decade, actually since the financial crisis. And in fact, um, while historically P.E. ratios for uh, international stocks have always been lower than U.S. stocks, in 2021, they were three standard deviations below what they normally are in terms of the comparison. That's a left tail kind of un, very, very unusual type of event. Call it 1.5 times in a thousand that that would occur. And um, so valuations for international look extremely attractive. And of course, you don't just look at valuations. Uh, there's other things that need to be thought about and you want to be uh, very selective and you want to have patience when you invest in the international markets, but they do look attractive. And I want to add to that, to uh, say that international small cap value stocks right now, the price to book is roughly 0.81, which is wow. really, that's a nice discount. <laughs> So I know you guys, uh, we've spoken about this before, really focus on the importance of asset allocation and broad diversification. So given uh, these, these market observations, what, what impact would that have on how you would allocate to the primary asset classes in this coming year? Do you want it? Okay. So um, generally, what we, we do take a look at everything that's going on, and there are a lot of risks. You know, while the economy still looks like um, there's limited scarring and it hasn't um, really had too much trouble and it looks like the markets will continue to go forward, um, this question, first of all, about whether we'll actually see the same level of returns, they're probably going to be much more dampened. We have concerns around um, the fixed income market because we're not necessarily getting the returns that we've gotten in the past. And so where else do you go? And one area that we've been developing a lot of expertise in is in alternative investments. Um, we like to call them enhancers because we believe they enhance our overall portfolio. We're looking for, um, normally when you're looking for um, investments, you're looking at three things. You're looking at, does this investment, does this asset class add diversification to my portfolio? Um, the second thing you're looking at is, does this, um, in some cases, does this asset class provide an income opportunity? So um, especially when bonds aren't necessarily doing their work, we're looking at other areas like real estate that can deliver some income. Um, and the third piece is, of course, appreciation. And so we're, we're looking at all the different asset classes and um, creating portfolios that can weather the storm through um, whatever we wind up seeing in 2022 and beyond. And I just want to mention on top of that is that if you look at, if you start to dissect the, the stocks that are in the S&P 500, probably about 10 of them represent about 35% of the value right now. And if you extract those stocks from the S&P 500, the price to earnings ratio for the rest of the market is, is much lower than it is for those 10 stocks. And we tend to lean uh, toward value in our approach as well. And we uh, growth has outperformed value for the last 10 years. So we think that value could be, I'm not going to say it's undervalued, but it's not as richly valued as growth is. So we do tend to lean toward value and we, we, will, we will continue to do that. And do you do that generally through uh, ETFs, individual stocks? Uh, how do you, when you, when you determine that, how, what tools do you use to get into those so we, we don't like to pick stock in uh, in our experience there are very few people that can pick stock successfully and beat the market that way so we usually use very broad based index funds although we'll use different types of index funds uh the traditional way to index is the so-called capitalization weighted where you weight the representation of each stock within the index is based on its market value we use an equally weighted index and we also use an index that's weighted based on the actual revenue of the company. And we think those are more representative of the true value of the companies within the economy. So I don't know if you know any names off the top of your head, but just so listeners will have a better idea of what sorts of companies would fall into that, that value classification. Now we know who the high flyers are, uh, but you know, those that you would class as value, you'd buy them broadly, but what kinds of companies are those? Uh, well, 
first of all, think of it conceptually. A value company is a company that um, the price is somewhat accurately reflective of what they provide. They can, um, we kind of, they've proven themselves. Um, they, they demonstrated their value as opposed to a growth stock where some of it is, it, some of the price is very speculative. We don't really know what's going to happen. That's why um, you can't really value a growth stock as well as you can value a value stock. But value stocks could be anything from McDonald's to Home Depot to, I mean, so there's industrials. The energy or, or, stocks, a lot of the energy stocks as well. They tend uh, to be industrials. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. So uh, cir circling back, if we could, you mentioned using uh, alternative assets to help uh, deal with the uh, underperforming uh, bond market or opportunities in the bond market. Are there any particular uh, things in the alternative asset classes that you that you favor? I think you mentioned real estate. What are some other types of uh, investments that are held in the alternative category? So one uh, one different or unique asset class, something called reinsurance bonds. Uh, we believe that enhances uh, portfolio diversification. They have a, a, a decent yield, and also their performance is not tied to other asset classes. For example, corporate bonds tend to act like corporate stock in uh, market declines. Reinsurance bonds don't act that way, and yields is much higher right now than uh, most corporate bonds. And additionally, we also are in the alternative lending space. Uh, that's a, a, a mutual fund that actually is backed by uh, consumer loans, and the yield is quite high, it's six to eight percent. And once again, it's a it's a different type of risk than you normally have within a portfolio. And Laura is very good at explaining this. The idea of constructing a portfolio is combining different risks and making sure the portfolio's uh, behavior is not affected all by one risk, but instead by many risks. So I would think since, since you guys uh, have an advisory practice, a big part of, of helping clients is helping them to have realistic expectations. And is there some uh, sense where when we're coming off of actually two very strong years, surprisingly, given the, the pandemic backdrop, that uh, wh what do you do to help clients maybe just have a better or a more realistic understanding of what even to expect in a year like we might be seeing ahead? Firstly, we are very big in terms of education. We really want our clients. We spend a lot of time one-on-one -on -one with our clients. We try to, we have a, a YouTube channel. It's your smarter money <laughs> um, uh, that we sponsor, Atlas Fiduciary Financial Sponsors. And we try to really educate our clients on our choices and getting them to understand um, th this whole concept of diversifying risk, which a lot of people don't really, they think diversification just means don't put all your eggs in one basket. Right. And you know, that's, that's an interesting component of it. You don't want to have too much of one company or another company, but it's much, much more than that. It's um, beyond just not having all your eggs in one basket. It's about finding other types of asset classes that won't move um, in the same direction as the other. So if the stock market all of a sudden doesn't do well and we have a really bad year, we have other items like the reinsurance bonds, which the reinsurance bonds might have a bad year. It's not that they're not risky. They might have a bad year, but it's probably due to natural disasters. So there's, it's not correlated. They, they don't happen at the same time. And so we... Um, try to get this whole smooth, smoothing of performance. So it's always interesting because actually in when the U.S. stock market is going um, way up, it's just going straight up, our portfolios are not because we're, 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 we have other kinds of asset classes that are dampening the effect of what the U.S. stock market is doing. But when this just, the U.S. stock market starts going down, that's when our portfolios really do tend to shine because um, people see that they don't have the same kind of volatility that they would have if they were just in the U.S. stock market. And I want to add to that, the uh, U.S. stock markets average 17% a year in return over the last five years, where its historical average is 11% a year. So that, that kind of tells us something, doesn't it? 
makes us question whether that kind of performance can continue over the next couple of years. And we, we find it somewhat doubtful. Yeah, I, I, I tend to agree. So in closing, uh, what advice do you have for the average investor for this upcoming year? The average investor should, first of all, make sure that they have a disciplined strategy, make sure that they have a strategy and make sure that they are going to take a disciplined approach to investing. That way they won't get into too much trouble. You want to keep emotions out of it. Um, that would be, I think, the number one advice to any um, any investor. A lot of investors allow their, themselves to react to the market. That is not the time to make a decision. When the market does something, you should already know what you're going to do before the market does it. Right. Stephen, you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I, I would say this. Don't think you're smarter than the market. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? And and we don't think we're smarter than the market. That's why our clients are I so well the hard way, Steve. <laughs> With that. <laughs> we learned the hard way. Yeah, after yes, so many did. years in the business, um, you, you learn to park your yep. hubris at the door. That's correct. Great. Yep. So uh, thank you guys for joining us today. And uh, we look forward to speaking with you next quarter. Thank you for having us.